written out some of the arguments there. Um, and today, since it's the last lecture, it's supposed to be a lecture that nobody can follow, so. <laughs> I'm going to talk about, you know, um, more recent so stuff I've been working on for quite a while, and uh, I'll, I'll take the absolute simplest case of that, uh, which, uh, okay, for the sake of uh, not losing everyone in five minutes. So, um, so we're going to modify the tangent groupoid. And of course, um, the point is that there's a, a different pseudo differential theory associated to that, and therefore a different notion of ellipticity and different new index theorem. Um, we already s I've already discussed when I gave you the construction of the tangent groupoid that it you know, generalizes to what is called the adiabatic groupoid of a Lie groupoid. So any groupoid has a deformation to a vector bundle, uh, or the other way around. Um, but uh, the group I'll discuss is not an example of that. It's, it's really different. Um, and the easiest case to explain and also to work out if you want to do it by hand yourself is the case of foliation. So let me start with foliation. So so I'm going to uh, take a smooth manifold again, M. And uh, we pick a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle, which is integrable. So, uh, floppy notation, but I uh, hope everybody knows what I mean by that. So, if you have a section in H and a section in H, two vector fields, you take the commutator of vector fields, you get a vector field in H. Right? So, this makes it integrable. I need to uh, be more frugal with my board space, I've learned. So by Frobenius, uh, this means that uh, locally, right? You can you can pick a chart such that the uh, okay, this is R P times R Q. So this is R P. Then this I guess is R Q. Uh, that the H is just exactly the tangent to R P. So as my words say, this is. In, in suitable coordinates, it's the span of the first few ve coordinate vector fields. Uh, was it P? Right, so you can pick locally, you can pick uh, such charts, and these are the leaves, etc. Okay, so let me not talk about operators yet. I'm just going to build a groupoid. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, slowly work towards a point of view where. Once you have the groupoid, everything else follows. That's kind of the goal. So um, I'm going to build a groupoid which, as before, has an exceptional fiber at t equals 0. It's parameterized by uh, a real variable. And, and also, everywhere except at 0, I'm going to put the pair groupoid, m cos m, because that's where operator kernels live, right? so this is never going to change. Uh, and then I want to put something here, something new. And this could be, uh, OK, so here, here's the idea. And then there should be only one possible answer, which you don't have to work out. Yeah, what I want to do is this. So we know that this is achieved by blowing up uh, one of the m, one of the, one of the, right, so this is m cos m. So in my, uh, in my picture, my mental picture, where we had the base of the groupoid, so the unit space is m cos r at t equals zero. We need to figure out what, what this should be. And at, at all other values of t, we had uh, m here and m here. This m, by the way, is not the m in m cross m. This is the diagonal, of course. But anyway, uh, the fibers are, are m. These are the, these were the range fibers. Um, what I want to do is blow up m not by t inverse, as you get closer to 
equals zero, but by uh, I blow up the leaves by T inverse, just as uh, when you construct a tangent groupoid. But I'm going to blow up transversely by T inverse squared. All right. So at this point, this is just a, a game. Uh, Okay, so now it's X, so does this make sense? Is this, well, it makes sense in coordinates, obviously. Right, so you can do this in coordinates, but okay, then you have to kind of make sense of, of it in a slightly more invariant way. And also the question is, what should I put here at the origin so that it glues together smoothly? Um, any guesses? That's not a fair question. It's almost TM, but not quite. Okay, so uh, the canonical thing to put here is H. Obviously, there's tangent vectors in th that's what comes from the first blow up. The, you blow up the leaves in the, in the usual way. But the transversal thing, if you, if you work out uh, what happens canonically, is that you really get the normal bundle. So you get uh, horizontal vectors plus normal vectors. So it's not exactly the tangent fiber, it's, uh, but of course, it's, it's isomorphic up to some section. Right, so n is the, is, is the normal bundle. Okay, so it's a little bit of, it's not hard. You just need to sit down and convince yourself that this, this gluing is well-defined. Okay, so what's the groupoid here? This is just, uh, again, a, a bunch of abelian groups. Okay, so it's really not anything. It looks like almost the same thing as the tangent groupoid, but it's not. Um, all right, so now the, the, the best question to ask would be, why on earth would you want to do this stuff? At this point, it is. Otherwise, uh, yeah, uh, to make sense out of, OK. So your exercise will be to do this for arbitrary h, which can be done. But yeah. So, so it's not essential, but uh, it makes life a lot easier. But It's not so clear what it means to blow up transversal to H if H is not integrable. You're blowing up the manifold M, right? So and H is not a submanifold; it's just a direction. So, but it can be done. So, yeah. All right. So, what's the motivation here? Well, I'll, I'll give one that's not really a motivation, but it's something that's easy to understand. And then the second one that could be a motivation. Um, there are cases where the operators you're interested in are, are not elliptic. Uh, and I'll give you two. Uh, one is, OK, this is, this is way too high bryo setting, but it's an easy example. Uh, we all know that the heat, the heat operator is regular. Okay, so. Minus, maybe, I don't know. Right, solutions are always smooth. And this is also, of course, true on a manifold. Uh, how do you prove this? Well, one way could be to produce a parametric, just as you prove that elliptic operators are Laplaces. Now, but, but where is the parametric? It's not elliptic. so. Right, so in the usual calculus, there is no, it's not, a, it's not invertible modular smoothing in the usual calculus. So you need a different calculus, and uh, as I'll try to argue, this is the correct one. So what we're doing is we're treating, so this, this would be then, let's say, Laplacian in the leaves direction, or it's now just a vibration, and DDT transversely. I'm going to just uh, decree that this is order two. And so it's part of the highest order part of the operator, and this agrees with the scaling by t, t to the negative 2. So those vector fields are weighted as if they are of order 2. That's one motivation. Uh, it's not a real motivation. It's just a simple example that's familiar. Um, another motivation are the operators that you find in the paper of Conor Moscovy, where they 
uh, produce a spectral triple for foliations, and particularly for type 3, as far as I understand, is uh, the hard case. Uh, where do I have, okay, I'm not going to go over the whole construction. The point is that in their, the D in their spectral triple, right, so the, the, what, what should be the Dirac operator, is built out of a differential operator, which is, I can't remember if it's order two in the leaves and one transversely of order four in the leaves and two transversely, one, one of those two, I forget the exact details. But it's one of these sort of, you know, mixed, uh, mixed, mixed order operators. Okay, so to analyze these types of operators, we could get to show, for example, that this is a Fredholm operator and has all the, all the, all the properties of a K-homology class. And that's the goal, to prove it's a K-cycle. Uh, you need a different calculus. And the appropriate calculus is uh, known to analysts as the Heisenberg calculus. And to answer an earlier question, this is the absolutely dumbest, easiest case of the Heisenberg calculus. It's for foliations, and indeed, this can be done for pretty much arbitrary age. The case for which it's been worked out in great detail are contact structures. Yeah, but I'm going to stick with this because this is easier to understand and gets across the gist of, our, of, this, of the technique. All right. Um, All right, so the idea here, as I said, and this goes back to Pollant and Stein. Somewhere, I believe, in 74, is to say that uh, the order of a vector field is 1 if it's uh, a section, if it's horizontal, if it's, if it's a derivative in the, in the leaves. And the order of a vector field is 2. If it's not, if it's anywhere transversal, then you should say it's a second order operator. So what, uh, what this does is that this induces a new filtration on the algebra of differential operators. Right, where usually when you want to somehow get a lowbrow idea of what is the order of a differential operator, you just pick coordinates, you write down a differential operator in terms of ddx1 through ddxn. So in other words, you're choosing the coordinate vector field, commuting coordinate vector fields as your basic derivation. Uh, here, this is not going to work. What you want to do is, well, it works for foliations actually, but you just want to pick you're saying that a product of vector fields has the order in which it's just the sum of the orders of the vector fields. And then you get. X is, X, X is the vector field. It's a filtration, right? So it's. So to say that it's order two, I really mean it's, 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 it's of order less or equal to. And if it's nowhere, so if it's nowhere tangent to H, then it is an order two operator yeah, as a differential operator. So the order of a differential operator is just, you know, the small, you, you have to pick vector fields that minimize the, the order, and then that's the one. Right, so, um, <coughs> okay, I discussed this this morning a little bit. Uh, if you have a filtration, there's a filtered algebra, there's an associated graded algebra. Okay, the highest order part, therefore, has to be interpreted in a new way. And you'll see, obviously, that, uh, say, for the heat operator, the DDT will be part of the principal symbol. It will go into the principal symbol data uh, of the operator in this, in this setting. Okay, so that's uh, why you might want to do this. Um, so now we argue, as before, Um, 
given an operator P, that P, oh sorry, little p, on M, uh, what do I need to do? So if I want to somehow understand what happens, I want to relate it to this groupoid. Uh, instead of writing it as a sum of uh, coordinate vector fields, then locally I should write it some as a sum of monomials. I guess, oh wait, I'm, I simplified things. No, I can do the exact, I can do the right thing. So you have A alpha, let me write everything out. And then here, uh, let me put two brackets here. And here, of course, when you, you use your new sense of order, so. Right, so the transversal vector fields are counted double. Okay, so it's uh, the only thing that changes is the, so that the, value, that the order of the monomials has been modified. And then for the highest order part, which, uh, as I explained, or hope, uh, at least I said, uh, is not an operator on the manifold, but uh, it's something that makes sense in your freeze coefficient. So this is at a point in our manifold. Will just be, again, formally you freeze the coefficient, and then you do the same thing. But now, You take the highest order part in a new sense. So this just gives a new, right? So if you do this for the heat operator, well, okay. So for the heat operator, this is already on the, on our end. But if you had the heat operator on a manifold, let's say the Laplace in this Riemannian one, and you cross with R or with a circle or whatever you want to do, uh, then these symbols uh, are just constant coefficient heat operators. Okay. So you just freeze coefficient each point. In. All right, so more generally, well, this is what we get. So these are constant coefficient operators again. On, well, so it turns out to be on canonically on this thing, which you can identify with a tangent fiber. And it's homogeneous. with, I don't know how to see it, uh, in a graded sense. <laughs> right, where this is order one and this is order two. Because <coughs> uh, these are constant. So you interpret this, this is not, a, a, again, this is not an operator on the manifold M. This is an operator on the tangent fiber at M, or this thing. So M is fixed, and then you, you freeze the coefficients, right? So these are, this is the, what, what is referred as freeze coefficients. At M. But uh, yeah, the only thing that's different from the elliptic example is that you include low order terms transversally according to this yoga. Okay, and then uh, so fat P on this, well, let's call this groupoid something. So here it's gonna be H plus N. And I'm gonna call this uh, fat P sub H. Right, so it's not a tangent groupoid, but it's something like a tangent groupoid. So this is, uh, as before, it's just T to the D times P on M. Let me see, which one did I pick? I think I now have the other one, this one. And I take my 
constant coefficient operators on these fibers. Okay, so by, by construction, this all glues together uh, to a smooth, to a differential operator with smooth coefficients. But so I'm just repeating everything that I did before. That's, so that's kind of the point, just in a different way. Any questions so far? Yeah, just abelian groups in this case. So it's, uh, that's why I pick a foliation. It's all nice and simple. Yeah. Um, yeah, the only, so the point is that these are abelian groups, but they're graded abelian groups. So that, that's the kind of, the, the, the grading is the only thing that's different from before. Um, okay, so let me uh, also make, okay, so here's now a remark. And this is a belief system so far, but uh, I'm pretty close to uh, actually finding a proof. There's a lot of technical lemmas. So I work with, uh, I'll, I'll discuss this next week, uh, with Bob Junkin, who's in Clermont-Ferrand, uh, because of working with this kind of stuff in different settings, uh, there's a desire, and, and I think we've turned it into a theorem, that if you can construct a groupoid like this, there should be a pseudo-differential calculus that just comes with it. Okay, we know in this case, because it's, it's been worked out by analysts, we know it for contact manifolds, because it's the Heisenberg calculus, of which there's books on this. Uh, and then along comes Pierre Joule, and he needs it for some special case where H is a bundle of co-dimension three. And then there's no analytic uh, literature anywhere that says that, this, that the calculus makes sense. There should be, it's clear what you should try to do, but it's really not so clear that everything generalizes. Because the contact manifold is locally uh, the Heisenberg group. Right? There's an open, there's a Darboux theorem, just as for foliations, there's a Darboux theorem. But in these general settings, there's no such thing. And then, so all the proofs don't work. And anyway, so uh, there's faith that that probably works out. But if you want a proof, then you know nobody wants to do this. And you have to sit down and spend six months trying to work out the whole calculus from scratch for some special case, just because you need a parametric, right? So um, what we're, what, what I think what we're very close in achieving is the following, is that the existence of the groupoid implies the existence of an appropriate differential calculus. And uh, a priori, there's a, what it, you know, if it exists, it should be the following thing. Uh, so this algebra is a subalgebra of the algebra I defined last time. Right? You can convolve families of distributions on a group. Groupoid. Uh, it's a subalgebra. So the question is which elements are in there. And these will be the elements that, uh, with the following properties. So you can put them, say, at t equals 1. You pick some kernel of this type. You put it at t equals 1. OK, it's supposed to be pseudo differential. So the singularities are at the identity, at the, on the diagonal. So it has to be smooth everywhere else. And now you just uh, do the simple minded thing. You put, so it's supposed to be of order d. So you put t to the d times this thing at all other values of t, non-zero values. And then the requirement is that you get something smooth on the whole groupoid. In other words, it has to extend smoothly to zero and give you something homogeneous there. Homogeneous in this graded sense. So that's where it's different from the usual calculus. Okay. So this picks out certain kernels. And then now, but now you need to prove. So this is, for starters, is a coordinate independent uh, definition. I mean, you need to do one coordinate calculation, namely, make sure that your groupoid is well defined. That's the only place you need to do it. And then, uh, so now you need to argue that this really is a pseudo differential calculus. So, what does that mean? There's various ingredients. It has to be filtered, it has, you know, you need various Sobolev theorems, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's a bunch of things to prove, but uh, we're, we're sort of close to, it's either going to be true on the nose or with minor modifications. Okay, so, it seems that this, this works. Uh, any case, 
going to follow Masood's uh, lead here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of space there, so it will be used later. Um, right, so in this particular case, that calculus we already know it exists because it's it was defined in the analytic literature. Um, but uh, ah, but it's a symbol in this calculus. It's kind of interesting because it's easy to understand if you know elliptic theory. Uh, you need to take okay, this is a convolution operator, as as defined. It's actually a differential operator, so it's convolution with a distribution that's supported at zero on an abelian group. So you can just do Fourier theory. You just take it just as well, there's nothing different. It's just uh, Rn. So you take the Fourier transform. You want to invert this thing. So the symbol is just a symbol. It's, it's, it's the exact same symbol as before. So the symbol at mc is just the same thing as before, but with this minor modification. This here is the modification, which is easily overlooked because it's a subscript. Uh, the only thing that's different in the subscript is that my notion of order is to be changed. Okay, so you pick the symbol in the ordinary sense of the word. It's just a polynomial in C, except you pick the highest order part in its weighted or graded sense. So the symbol of the heat operator in this calculus, for example, ah, I like this. Uh, Uh, well, it would be something like uh, right sum of ci squared i equals one to n plus, and then okay, uh, there's an i, right? So uh, plus or minus, let's say minus i c naught. And uh, the nice thing about this uh, symbol is that uh, since there's an i there, it's imaginary. This is actually invertible for all non-zero c. And that's how you prove that the heat operator is regularizing. So you have the appropriate calculus. So it's invertible. All right? No, this is just uh, just just classical operators. But not elliptic. Okay, so, all right. Elliptic in this sense, but yeah. Um, well, the longitudinal things are elliptic in the ordinary sense. Yes. But so, as we discussed this morning, you probably need another. See, if, if our philosophy were change the groupoid, then hopefully the appropriate calculus drops out. I, I, I believe actually that this is. True, but not completely done yet. This uh, again, the, this principal symbol is completely canonical. As uh, if you don't take this, yeah, right. If you want it to be canonical, you need to take this thing. So it's a function on h star plus n star, and as such, it is completely canonical. Well, well, if you have a co you take coordinates on M and you take new coordinates, right? So those in induce coordinates on the tangent bundle, therefore on the cotangent bundle, and therefore also on the quotient. So these are the, all these coordinates are induced by coordinates on the manifold. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes. Well, actually, so what you really should do is just check that it's, that, that limit is well defined because you don't use any coordinates in there. So it's a priori free of coordinates, and you just want some explicit expression, and then you work that out in a choice of coordinates. So it's a priori coordinate free. Right. So this is not the definition. This is just the calculation. <coughs> 
Um, okay, so we have an invertible symbol. And uh, right, so the other thing that we're going to get hopefully for free is that, again, from the groupoid, is that the invertibility of that symbol guarantees just by, by the same kind of arguments as in the usual calculus people, sort of an extension of this symbol to positive t, where you get, uh, you know, so you get some quantization map, if you like. So that will give you a parametric in, in the appropriate process. And so the, this implies that that operator that you started with, whichever one it is, is you could, you know, some people are then say it's an elliptic operator in, in this new calculus. But I don't like that word. Elliptic just means elliptic. Or whatever you want to call it. It's, right, it's a Fresnel element or... Uh, so the word used for this by analysts is it's a hyperelliptic operator. Okay, so, um, all right. So that's the analysis part, but then, where are my notes? Let me just get to my notes. Um, so, All right, you need a lot more because this is an unbounded operator. You want to make k, k cycles, so you want to make it bound. So you need the whole shebang of that you get from a pseudo differential calculus. And I, I believe all of it will fall out from the existence of the group void. Um, okay. Okay, here I was going to explain the calculus, but let me not do that. Um, okay, so now. Uh, once this is established, which it's not yet, but uh, okay, for this example, it is established by analysts, so we can just take their work. Um, we're going to now uh, prove an index theorem for these operators. So these are Fredholm operators. And uh, okay, there's no particular motivation for this other than sheer curiosity. But uh, we have a symbol, we have a Fredholm operator. Uh, as I said, uh, this the, the colonoscopy paper might be a motivation. This is a, it's more complicated because it's gamma equivariant, so it's really right. It's this further step. But let's first do the non-equivariant case with a single operator. Uh, how do you get its index? And I, uh, I actually started thinking of a more complicated case, the case of contact manifolds. And then I was talking to Henry Moscovich, and he suggested a look at foliation. And it was extremely disappointing because it took like an afternoon and it turned out to be a trivial answer. However, then I look in the literature and the trivial answer doesn't exist yet. So it was interesting in that sense that there's no other proof uh, that I could find anywhere uh, of the following theorem. So let me erase something. I think I don't want a theorem in that corner. So. Of? Yeah, it's just multi it's just ordinary multiplication. It's com it's because it's an abelian group, so you get convolution on an abelian group, and on the Fourier transform, it's just pointwise multiple. So it's it's very boring. There's nothing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everything's the same, but it's literally it is a different calculus. So the uh, the parametrics will not exist in the usual calculus. So you need a different calculus, but it's it's. Modulo the grading thing, it's exactly, it, it behaves exactly like the classical calculus. Yeah. Um, I haven't thought about that, but that's an interesting question. I don't know. Okay. Okay, uh, wiping break. Uh, what shall I save? Um, uh, nothing. <coughs> so 
So uh, here's why I'm happy with the uh, fat P and the uh, convolution algebra that I introduced this week is that at least uh, a, a great deal of stuff can just be repeated now without any further thought. Okay? I don't have to reinvent some kind of clever new thing. I can do exactly what I did before. I have a fat P on uh, my modified groupoid. And uh, if uh, P is... Uh, Let's call it H elliptic. This, you can interpret this in two ways. It's uh, short for hyperelliptic and also for elliptic in the sense of H calculus or whatever. Okay. Or Heisenberg elliptic if it's a Heisenberg calculus. And uh, what you get, and this is the key thing, is that this fat P is also sort of Fredholm, but in the sense that it's invertible module in the algebra or ring, let's say algebra, of smooth families of distributions on the groupoid. It's not a tangent groupoid, but whatever the analog of a tangent groupoid. Modulo smoothing. And here again, uh, restrict to Right, I restrict my parameter t to the interval 0, 1, the closed interval 0, 1. So why is this good? This means that I get a class associated to this guy by the same, for again, I want to emphasize it's the exact same formula. I didn't explain the formula. I, I only wanted to show that there's a formula and that okay, you apply it again. You don't have to come up with a new formula. It's the same formula that produces an idempotent out of this thing in the elliptic case will produce an idempotent here, and it lives in the algebraic K theory, and therefore also the C-star algebraic K theory of the close C-star closure of this ideal. So you get an element by the exact same argument and without further need for anything in here. It's reduced, but it's the same. Um, and then you repeat what Kahn did. Okay, this was the whole point of this, this groupoid, this deformation, is you evaluate at zero. So we get the K-theory. Well, okay, so what is it really? Plus the C-star algebra of the groupoid H plus N, which is just a vector bundle, so it's a family of abelian groups. Okay, so on the Fourier transform, this is all the familiar stuff, right? So this is T0 of H star plus N star which is just uh, K-theory, topological K-theory of H star plus N star. And really, canonically, is the K-theory of C star N. Because the identification is unique up to homotopy. So there's an actual, in, at the level of K-theory, they're identical. Okay. All right, and then Again, by the same argument as before, the ideal of the map from this C-star algebra, the kernel of the map from this C-star algebra to this C-star algebra, is contractible for the exact same reason. It functions from open interval 0, close at 1, to the compact, so that it contracts to 0. So this is an isomorphism. So it can be inverted. Okay, so if you go here and then evaluate at 1, you get the compact operators, k of a compact operator, so z. And the existence of this fat P at this level, okay, uh, which, which restricts to the symbol as I defined it before, but now it's, which lives here, it's just, a, just a function on C star M as before. It's just a classical symbol, but it doesn't have the usual, it's not homogeneous in the usual sense, it's, but who cares? It gives a K theory class. And then uh, there's a map to Z, and of course, then this is the index. Now, uh, you have to be a fool not to believe that. So we have a map Z, which sends a symbol to an integer K. 
surely this is the Atiyah Singer map. What else could it possibly be? But that's not a proof. That's the right thing. So, um, but it's true. So this is the theorem. So the theorem says that the index of P is the usual thing. So if you know the Atiyah Singer formula, Right, this is the formula for that you use for an elliptic operator, and you can just stick in the symbol of these heat kernel type operators or whatever, these mixed mixed degree operators. So as I said, this is uh, I found this disappointing because this is just it's just there's nothing new. It's just the same old symbol with a minor modification and you get an index formula. Now, as I said, there's a what indicates that this might maybe not be as trivial as it seems. So I is that uh, there's an old paper by Hermander <coughs> where he proved something for rho delta, if you're familiar with pseudo So there's a the pseudo differential operators we typically work with are one zero, and then there's a whole class of rho deltas, and um, these these guys turn out to be half half. And he proves uh, some index formula for hyperliptic operators of this type for our operators of type rho delta, where rho is strictly less than delta. So the half-half just sort of fails. It just doesn't, just, he just misses it somehow. And uh, that's the only thing that comes close. It's, it's also a formula exactly like this, where you have a symbol in the usual sense. But for some strange reason, this, this foliation case, the, the, the more you know, natural one, where you have an order two and an order one, uh, doesn't fit in this theorem. So the, I really could not find any. Uh, this, this seems to really be a new theorem. OK. If you can tell me how. So, so in this case, it's a little harder to argue that you cannot. I mean, I don't know if you cannot. Yeah, but uh, the problem is that, so uh, the same argument, so I can give an answer in a more complicated setting, unfortunately, not in this setting. So uh, I c you can now repeat the whole game for context manifolds, for example. Okay, the, the, the now things become more complicated. So the thing you have to put at, so the evaluation of zero, this will no longer be a, a commutative algebra. Be, be a non commutative algebra. But then, by general nonsense in non commutative geometry, the con com isomorphism and such, you, you, you get a canonical isomorphism with this thing again. And so, again, you predict that you can just use the Atiyah Singer formula. And it turns out that's true. And I'll discuss a little bit why. And so, you write a formula like this. And then the question is you have to compute this thing. Uh, but the, the, the adding, uh, uh, so that you get similar operators, the sort of second order in the h directions, and maybe lower first order transversely. It turns out that ellipticity or hyperellipticity, in this case, depends on the, trans on the coefficients of the transverse vector field. And it has forbidden values. There's some kind of quantization going on in the symbol calculus. And you get uh, the symbol uh, has certain harmonic oscillators in it. And then you, know, you, have to, you have to miss the spectrum of a harmonic oscillator. So you get, uh, say, in one particular case, you, the, the transverse coefficient can be any complex number except an odd integer. So it's sort of like, you know, and this is completely different from elliptic. So there's an actual set of forbidden values. Okay, so, and the index depends on exactly how you wind around those forbidden values. And if you just said an epsilon times GDT squared, transversely kill all that information. So a priori, you can deform to an elliptic operator, but any naive uh, scheme that you might devise is, is not going to work. Yeah, so that typically when you talk to analysts, it's the first thing they say, and that's why I had to think about it over the years. It's certainly not going to work. It's not that simple. Uh, although this theorem is so straightforward that you would, I don't know, it seems like it should be an easy proof. I just don't know any. Um, anyway, I've, I've not given you a proof. I've only, uh, you know, argued by faith that there couldn't possibly be a different index map from this group to Z. Okay. 
uh, but that's not a proof. So how does the proof go? And this is uh, another groupoid argument. Uh, so it's kind of nice for people who like groupoids like me. So um, we have our modified tangent groupoid. And I want to stress again that this is not an adiabatic groupoid, right? There's a general, uh, general construction for an adiabatic groupoid of any Lie, Lie groupoid. And this is not one of those. Uh, because it looks like this. Uh, right, so here we have h plus n. And we have n plus m. And then there's a blow up by mixed mixed wakes. Uh, so that's g. Uh, but now I can take its adiabatic groupoid. So the adiabatic groupoid of this thing. Okay, so now and then you deform sideways. So it gets repeated. So here we have h plus n as well. Everywhere here we have m plus n. But now you blow up uh, by factor S inverse and you get the Lie algebra of this guy, which is Tm. And then this one blows up just the h plus n. You're just blowing up a vector field, a vector space. Infinitesimally, it's still a vector space. So you get some kind of square, right, where here you look, you have the, uh, the, the classical tangent groupoid vertically. Okay. So now, uh, okay, so now we have a, a, a groupoid over a square with two parameters. And uh, okay, I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna pull a suit on this. Okay, you get various k theories here. Well, let's write. Um, now you do various restrictions in a particular order. First, you 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 uh, restrict to these two edges. Okay. Now you have a kernel, which basically are t zero sections in this sort of half closed, half open square, where over each point sits a copy of m cos m. In other words, in the C-star algebra, it's just a copy of a compact operator. That's again a contractible ideal. So you contract this whole thing away. And so that restriction to these edges is a K theory isomorphism. So, um, okay, then you do uh, successive things where you, you know, you, you restrict to this edge, to this edge, and then finally to that point. Okay, and what you get, let me see if I can remember which is the direction the arrows go. Uh, so I think this one is, is isomorphic to the whole thing, so you get maps this, this way. And a priori, because of the existence of this big groupoid, this is a commutative diagram. This, uh, for very obvious reasons, this is just uh, a vector bundle. This is the same vector bundle, and you just blow up the fibers. So this, there's nothing happens here. You can just trivialize the whole thing. So this is just the identity map. Uh, this map here. Okay, it looks like there's some complicated uh, scalings going on, but it's really just, uh, again, an identification of the two. So there's, there's nothing going on here either. And then these two arrows remain. This is the Atiyah Singer index. So it's the index for elliptic operators. And this is the new index that we have for hyperelliptic operators. This is the H index. And then this commutes. So it proves that the new index for this new H calculus is, is just the old index. Okay. And this is why there were questions before, am I going to prove a Tia Singer? And I answered no, and this is why. I, I'm not proving a Tia Singer, I'm reducing things to a Tia Singer. So I just use the fact that we already have a formula for a Tia Singer map, and now have a new one that's just reduced to that one. 
Okay, and so that's how you get this theorem. Well, so I'm, yeah, I, I've thought about what this says about, you know, like if this is saying, the question, of course, is natural. Can you, what's that, can you somehow deform the operator? And I don't see how. I mean, you, somehow you can do this, the groupoid underlies the kernel, the operator kernel. So you can do, but you can do it at the level of the groupoid. I, I don't know how, to, I've thought about this off and on, but I don't see how this translates into somehow deforming the operators or something. I don't, I don't see that. It's, oh, it's a level of symbols, it probably is. It's a quantization, I think. Uh, so if, it's probably better to go to a more complicated setting because then not everything is identified and then it's, it's easy to see what's going on. But then this thing will be non-commutative and this will be commutative. And, uh, so it's some, it's actually some kind of quantization in that setting that of the symbol. So, um, yeah. But I think this is a very clear instance where, uh, okay, this is for foliations, but certainly if you m go to contact manifolds, uh, where the groupoids are not just there to somehow make things nice and pleasing or conceptualize it in a sort of a nice way, uh, it actually proves something and then, you know, that as usual, usually when you have a proof, you can find other proofs that somebody else likes, but um, it, it kind of guides the way to what you're supposed to do. And I think this is a good argument for, uh, for, for the tangent groupoid method um, or an example. Which decomposition? I'm not sure. Somebody understands the question. I need to. Secondary invariance. I no, I haven't thought about it, and I think this certainly is not a. This is just just a straightforward index, right? There's nothing. Well, we know what the idempotent is. It's just like I said. It's it's just a classical symbol. There's nothing. It's just not homogeneous in the ordinary sense. But in terms of for K theory, that's it's irrelevant that it's homogeneous. Right? It's irrelevant for the calculus, but for for the for the statement of the for the formula formation of the idempotents, etc. It makes it's completely irrelevant. Sorry. If it's a foliation, yeah. So far, I've only talked about foliation. So, let me just say a few words about um, generalizations beyond this. So, th I, I did the foliation because, like I said, it's already non trivial. This is a non trivial theorem. I'm not aware of any other proof. Uh, and it's the easiest to explain. Uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, my, 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 my feeling is that the heat operator is like the Laplacian, that it has no k homological instance, it's just dead zero. So it's, 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 it's empty, it's a non, it's a non question. You need something more interesting, and I think the the correct thing would be the Kohn Moskovitz operator, because that's effectively uh, a Dirac operator, but like replaced with a second order one in the in the least direction. Um, I haven't. I, I, the only reason I this I've n I haven't thought about foliations at all because that was that was too simple. But but there might be like, maybe because it's simple, you can actually find some applications. But I haven't really uh, been thinking about that at all. But if you have any suggestions, it would be kind of fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. It's, it should be uh, easy to find. There's another question. Um, okay, I have three minutes. So I'm not going to write anything. Let me just uh, say say in words the following thing. So, uh, so there's a game on the board, and and this uh, can be very easily generalized. You, like I said, you. First, the motivation for this problem came from contact manifolds. So people had been working on that. The, the actual Heisenberg calculus is, is actually defined on contact manifolds. Um, and, uh, okay, what needs to be modified? Uh, these vector fields, which are here coordinate vector fields, because the foliation is integrable. Okay, a contact structure is not integrable. So you need to replace the coordinate vector fields with vector fields adapted to your vector bundle. So the first P will be vector fields in the direction of H, and then you pick a bunch of transversals. So it's a little you know, unusual for analysts. That's not how you write differential operators, but if you just do that and you write the same formula, then you get, um, at least formally, you can define a highest order part. But then what the hell are these things? These are now polynomials in some in vectors. And, okay, again, it's an exercise. It's, it's just algebra. You can work out what this is. This needs to be interpreted as an element in the universal enveloping algebra of a nilpotent Lie algebra, where you, you take this thing and there's a bracket from two things in H, give a bracket in N, and N is central. So this becomes a nilpotent group now. So it's no longer abelian. But, okay, so for non-commutative geometry, that's, it's irrelevant. It's still a group, and it has a convolution algebra and everything. So these guys will now be convolution operators on a nilpotent group. And so our groupoid will, where is it? It disappeared, but we'll just have a non-abelian algebra at the, at the origin instead of an abelian one. So you can do a Fourier transform. That's why I usually don't use Fourier transforms at all. They don't generalize to that setting. They just stick to the kernel. Uh, okay, so that's a modification. And then Okay, the thing needs to be invertible. This can actually be worked out fairly easily. If, if you have the Heisenberg group, it turns out there's a deep theorem or beautiful theorem proven in the 70s where people who studied analysis on Heisenberg groups and nilpotent groups said the Heisenberg group only has two interesting representations, the Schrodinger and the anti-Schrodinger or the conjugate. Right? And if the thing is invertible in those two representations, then you have a, then the symbol is invertible. And this, you can write this down explicitly. It's actually, you can do this by hand. It's not as complicated as it seems. So you can check which operators are H elliptic in this uh, in this modified sense, and then okay, then you can define. As I said, from there on everything is the same. There's a formula for an idempotent; it works because of that algebra. We know it gives a K-theory class as an index map. But now this is actually c stra algebra of something non-commutative, and to get here, you need to con tom isomorphism. And that exists, and it's, it's canonical, well, but it's, it's completely uncomputable. So what you get is this theorem. The theorem is still true, and it's true by the same argument. You can build this adiabatic groupoid. So everything, it's literally like you just repeat everything. It's there's no modification. It's exactly the same argument, except uh, this, this thing here uh, exists. And there's a definition, and the definition goes, okay, there's a formula for an idempotent in a non-commutative algebra, and then there's a quantum isomorphism, which says there's a classical equivalent of that. Uh, but trying to compute that classical equivalent is effectively equivalent to, you know, having, being able to make use of this formula. You want a topological formula. It looks like a topological formula, but we don't have a topological formula for the symbol. It only exists a priori. Okay. And so... Um, there's a challenge there, and it's so far the only case I've been able to solve, apart from foliations, with Paul Baum. We finally figured out uh, what to do in the contact manifold case using K-homology, yet another set of tools. Uh, but for any other case, it's still open. So, for example, there's a book by Beals and Greiner that uh, Connor Moskovich referenced on, on Heisenberg manifolds. So that, again, just means that H has co-dimension 1. I don't have to make that assumption, but you can make that assumption. Then the calculus is relatively tame. It's a little bit more general than contact, and I have absolutely no idea how to do that in that case. Okay. 
So I know that this theorem is true, but I have no idea how to compute this thing. So anyway, I just just in closing, the exact same art. So that, that this is kind of what I've been working. I've been trying to get things at a level where it's easy to repeat in other settings. This is an example. All right. <laughs>